Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Interactive Visualization with R for Social Sciences, a presentation by Martin Hadley of the University of Oxford. My name is Michael Todd, and I'm the administrator of the Method Space website. Let me introduce you to today's guest, Martin Hadley. This is the second webinar, by the way, in a series from Sage's offering of computational social science online courses known as Sage Campus. Back to Martin. He's currently a research technology specialist at the University of Oxford and specializes in data visualization. His background is in biophysics and statistical computing. He's completing his Master of Physics at the University of Leeds. At the University of Oxford, Martin is helping to launch a data visualization service for researchers and is experienced in teaching data science skills to social scientists. Speaking of that course and of other online courses offered through Sage Campus, Today's webinar audience is being offered a big discount, 50%, for any of these course offerings. And you can learn about the offerings at the website campus.sagepub.com. Again, that's campus.sagepub.com. And make sure that you have this code, VIZWEB50, that's V-I-Z-W-E-B-50, at the ready. We'll repeat that code, V-I-Z-W-E-B-50, again at the end, and it's on the screen right now. As one hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view it in the coming weeks. And if you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen, or maybe on the left if you've minimized it, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. Now ordinarily we hold a Q&A session after the presentation. However, as Martin will be programming live, we encourage you to ask any questions you have during the live session. That way, Martin will try and answer all your questions while he is demonstrating a particular method. And if you have any questions for Martin, please use the Q&A box on the right of your screen, or you can tweet it using the hashtag SageCampus hashtag. And understand, you'll send your questions in, but I'll be presenting them to him. So let's start the visualization with our session. Martin, take it away. Hello folks, sorry about that while well, I'll just load up my screens. Um, so hello, thank you very much uh, Michael for the introduction. Uh, I'm Martin Hadley and I'm going to talk about interactive visualization with R. Uh, before I get my hands dirty with coding, um, I do want to I do want to introduce myself a little bit and the work that I've done with Sage. Um, so Sage have asked me to help them develop a course designed for social scientists to introduce R with the focus on creating interactive data visualizations so that folks can tell engaging and rich stories with their data. It's been really fun working on this course with Sage and we've had some really great feedback from it. The course runs fairly frequently and Sage and on it are working on a number of additional courses focused on R and data visualization in the near future. So do check out Sage Campus to look for those courses and hopefully to see my face and my voice a little bit more often. I hope to see you on one of those courses in the future. And so what about me? Well, as Michael said, I work at the University of Oxford as a reproducible research evangelist and data visualization specialist. I offer advice, support, and training to researchers in all four divisions of the university. All this happens through a service that I manage, which as of early 2018 is still a little bit beta, called the Interactive Data Network. This service aims to connect together resources and knowledge in reproducibly communicating research data sets from across the university. It's a really exciting and rewarding project to work on because I get to work with all sorts of different data sets. I'm a physicist by training, but it's really rewarding working with humanities, researchers and social scientists and people in the medical division who are working with data that I don't particularly understand the details of, but I know very much how to build visualizations that others can understand and do things with. So we're supposed to be a software agnostic service, really, but it turns out that the only technology that really provides everything that we need for a reproducible data visualization workflow is provided by R, R Studio, and Shiny. And these are exactly the tools that I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes. 
So the IDN has existed at Oxford for about a year and it's growing slowly, but it's only designed to help researchers at the University of Oxford. That doesn't really sit very well with my open source sensibilities and my desire to help everyone do reproducible data visualization. So that's why I'm really excited about a new project that I've started working on in collaboration with the University of Sheffield. And this is called Oxshev Data Viz. This only launched in very late December 2017, so this is very much beta, but we're working on combining resources that unite often disparate advice on research data management, reproducibility, visualization design, and software tool selection. So I very much suggest that if you're not at University of Oxford, that you check out the Oxchef Data Viz resources. And if you are, if you do happen to be at Oxford, then have a look at what resources I can provide you in my capacity there. Once again, at Oxchef, we try to be as software agnostic as possible, but really the toolkit that best supports the reproducible data viz workflow that we endorse is our R Studio and Shiny. So now I've introduced myself. Uh, again, after Michael did, I think that it's uh, a good idea to talk about these three questions. Why visualize data in the first place? And why does interactivity help? What is a reproducible data viz workflow? And how can we interactively visualize social sciences data with R? So what kind of data can we get into R? And what can we do with it? Well, the first question is why we should visualize data. And sadly, Research data is too often born and buried in a table. When you're amassing data or you're collecting data from a survey, your data is within Excel, you do some analysis of that within Excel, and then often, unfortunately, researchers then dump a table into a PDF. That's a real shame because tables often hide the interesting components of a data set. So the table that you can see on my slide here, that actually has some really interesting data in it which suggests that if you tweet about your research or you share it on other social media platforms, then that's likely to increase the number of citations that you get in the future. But having the data live and breathe within that table in a static PDF file doesn't make it very accessible or understandable, particularly to a non-expert reader or somebody that doesn't have access to the research publication that you've made. So that's why data visualizations are very important. And data visualizations aren't only important to you when you're actually communicating your research, they're really useful to you when you're doing exploratory data analysis. Exploratory data analysis is the stuff you do when you collect your data. So you've sent out a survey or you've gone to many sites and you've collected data and then you have it all and you go, I want to understand my data, I want to see what list of data do I have, what's the shape of it. That is what we call exploratory data analysis and data visualization really helps us do that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to our studio and do some exploratory data analysis for you. In my first and final slide, there's a link to a GitHub repository where you can find the code. I'm going to open up the folder post workshop and I'm going to double click on this file postworkshop.argvoj. This is going to open up our studio and my R Studio project. So here we go. Okay, so R Studio is just loading up, and I'll go to my file explorer. And I'm going to start with exploratory data analysis. So I'm going to open up this script file. And I'm going to load a couple of libraries at the top of my script file. So the tidyverse, our Figshare, so I can grab data from Figshare. Figshare is a data repository which provides DOI. So this is a reproducible way for me to access data. Then I've got a ggGraph library, tidygraph, an iGraph for doing graph network analysis, and the R Color Brewer library as well. So we'll load those libraries. I then have two comments here telling you where I've got my data from. So the DOI for the data is here, and this is a website explaining the online labor index project. I'm going to load my data from my repository. And here we go. So I'm going to download the file, which has B country data in the file name. 
And now I have the data on my machine. Let's have a look at how it looks. So I've got re region import, and I'm going to type a pipe and view. And we can see what we've got is we've got timestamp, count, country, country group, occupation. Okay, so an interesting question to ask from this data, something that we should understand from our data when we're doing exploratory uh, data analysis, is how many jobs are there per country group? And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the most recent data. We can see we've got data from, look, from uh, 2016 onwards. So let's just get data for the most recent date. So we'll go and we'll say region import filter timestamp is equal to max timestamp. So that's going to be the most recent day, which is today. And then what we're going to do is we're going to group our data by the country group. Okay. And then we're going to summarize that data by counting the total jobs in each country group. So I'll create a new column called total jobs, sum count. Okay, so we've got a table here which summarizes our data. But this, as I've said before, isn't a very good way to present the data. So we can see the size of these numbers here, but it doesn't really give us from a glance, an idea of how big one of these regions is compared to the other. So a static visualization is really useful to provide this information to me. So what I'll do is I'll use the ggplot library and I'll specify my aesthetics as x is equal to country group, y is equal to total jobs, I run that code, and what ggplot gives me is an empty coordinate system within which I can put objects. And so what I'll put is I'll put some columns. So this visualization is starting to look useful for me. Um, Bar charts work much better if they're horizontal rather than vertical because we often have long we often have long names for our columns. So let's rearrange that and say chord flip. So it's now much easier for us to read our labels, but it would be even easier to understand this data if we ordered our bars from largest to smallest. We can do that really easily with R by using the function factor, reorder, and total jobs. So now we have a visualization which communicates something really important about the data, which is that the United States dominates this market compared to all others. If you were to take the length of all the other bars, it would barely stack up to how long the United States is. And this is data, this is information about our data set that isn't communicated by a simple table. A more complicated kind of visualization is a network visualization. This is useful for where you have the interactions between different people. So if we scroll further down our script file, I'm taking an example from the Game of Thrones universe. So I'm going to import some data from two CSV files, and then I'm going to use the graph from data frame function from iGraph to create a graph. And then we'll say got iGraph, and we can see printed in my console that I have a graph with uh, 208 nodes and 326 edges. So how can I visualize this statically? Well, I can visualize this statically using the ggGraph library. So our pipe got iGraph into ggGraph. And I have an empty coordinate system within which I can add the components of my graph. So let's first add geome edge fan. And let's also add in my nodes as well.
So here we can see the connection between the different characters in the Games of Thrones universe. Now what I could go on and do is add labels to my chart here. So I could add the names of each of my characters on here, but that would really become quite messy when you have so many nodes in this network. And that's one of the problems with static charts. There's only so much that you can fit in them at any one time. So that's why we should really think about moving beyond dead trees when we're thinking about our visualizations. So we shouldn't just think about what can we include in a PDF that people are going to be able to print off. We should think about, can I build something which I can put on the web, which adds something in, to my visualization? A lot of publishers that I work with through the Okshef and the IDN um, uh, foundations are, um, are publishers who are interested in adding extra value to researchers. So researchers choose to publish with them. So there are a number of researchers who are trying to provide you the ability to embed interactive visualizations directly within your papers. F1000 are an ex excellent example of that. So F1000 now have the ability to embed plotly charts directly in publications printed there. A phrase which I hear sometimes from publishers is that interactivity is the new color chart. Back when print media was, was king, uh, publishers often differentiated themselves on how many colored charts there were, but now interactivity is one of the ways that publishers are trying to differentiate themselves. So what does interactivity provide? Well, interactivity provides alternative methods to access the same data. It allows users to slice through data sets, and it allows users to combine, it allows people to, to combine summary and detailed information together. So let's have a look at how I can make the two previous charts we used interactive and what benefits that provides to me. So I'll go to the benefits and interactivity to our script file and I will run the code here. So what I get out from here is I get a slightly more complicated data frame. Uh, I can see here that I've got the country group and the occupation column and then jobs and occupation. So here what I'm doing is I'm going to construct a stacked bar chart and I'm going to use the high chart library for that. The high chart library is an example of a HTML widget which allows us to create interactive charts. So I'll specify that my type of H chart should be bar, I'll say HCS. So the high chart aesthetics, X is going to be country group, Y is going to be jobs in occupation, and group is going to be occupation. Now if I run my code, what I have is a nice grouped bar chart. And what benefit does interactivity provide me here? Well now I can hover my cursor over individual bars and I can get the actual values for each of these occupations. Furthermore, I can go to the legend and I can remove specific um, occupations if I'm interested. So if I wanted to remove creative and multimedia, software development, professional services, and I just wanted to compare the size of these across the, the different country groups, then that's really easy for me to do. And I can provide all of that feature, all of those features within one chart, thanks to the interactivity. Whereas if we were only having static charts, we'd have to make six different versions of those static charts, and it then can be difficult to understand those altogether. So how about the graph? Well, let's just run our code here once more. So we get back our got i graph. And what we'll do here is we'll, we'll use the viz network library. And we'll specifically use the viz i graph function. So here we can see the same network as before, but now when I zoom in on the network, I can see the names of the individuals. 
So I can see here we've got Jane, Jane Lan Lannister. We can see we've got Joffrey over here as well. And as I hover over nodes, I get information about them as well. One well, last thing that I like to show that we can do is this options highlight nearest true. So now the graph looks the same, but if I select a node in the graph, it highlights for me only the first degree neighbors. So we can see the people who are directly connected to John. So we can see we've got I never know how to pronounce these names, so I don't know why I still include these in my examples. Um, but we've got a Targaryen here, and we've got Edward Stark and Lyanna as well. So here, interactivity is allowing me to provide all of the information in the network, because it gives me all of the names of the nodes, which I wouldn't be able to fit in on a static chart. And it also provides me information about who's connected to who, which would be really difficult to communicate in a static chart, and very difficult to communicate with pros without using a visualization. So that's what we can do with R and HTML widgets. But there's a thing called Shiny, which allows us to build interactive web applications with R without having to learn HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. One of my favorite examples of a Shiny app is provided here. So this is a Shiny app which was built by Dina Talley. Uh, to look at a certain sports ball um, event. I'm not very afraid with uh, sports, and I'm not sure what sport this actually is, uh, quite genuinely. But this website here is built using R. So we can see in the background that we've got a GIF, and then we can select a match between two people, so between Octa and BC. If I select that match, then it takes me to a different page. And what I can do is I can play through the match interactively. And this is built using R and Shiny. It's really impressive what we can do with R and Shiny without having to learn any CSS, JavaScript, or HTML. So Shiny working on your local machine is really, really simple to do. You install the Shiny library with install.packages Shiny, and then you can run Shiny apps on your local machine. But how about if you want other people to work with your Shiny apps? So you build something that's interactive, and you want to publish it to the web for other folks to see, just like that example that I just showed before. Well, there are two different solutions to you. They're for you. There's shinyapps.io, or there's Shiny server. Shinyapps.io is a hosted solution for Shiny apps. You can get a free account there and you can deposit, you can publish your Shiny apps so other people can see them. And there's, a, there's a free tier available and there are paid tiers which I use in the Interactive Data Network at the University of Oxford. And then there's Shiny Server, which allows you to install Shiny on your own server if you're interested. But that's probably not what we're going to be interested in when we're doing things. So what is a reproducible data visualization workflow? Well, a reproducible data visualization workflow looks very much like this. All of your research outputs should be identifiable by a unique DOI. So if you don't know, a DOI is a digital object identifier, and it's a way to say this thing is this unique thing. So when you publish papers, you typically have a DOI for each paper, and that allows you to resolve always to that paper without having to trust that your publisher's URLs remain the same. You have this nice number that begins 10 point, and then a bunch of letters and numbers after it, and that's the way to uniquely identify your publication. Data repositories like Figshare are places that you can deposit your research data. And that allows folks to actually reference the data as opposed to the study. That can be really useful because there may be somebody that's interested in getting the data from your research, but they're not particularly interested in the particular part of the data that you published about. They're interested in the data. By depositing that in a data repository, that means people can cite your research output. Now, if you build visualizations with code, you should also think about depositing those 
that, that code or your scripts somewhere which provides DOI. And the best place to do that is a data repository like Figshare. And then the interactive data visualization that you produce, it's possible to provide that a DOI as well. So people can go to a DOI which resolves to the interactive data visualization behind your research. And then what's this thing in the middle, this green ID? This is a thing called ORCID. An ORCID is a unique identifier for a researcher. Not many people have ORCIDs, unfortunately, but you should because it's a way to say that I am Joe Smith as opposed to this other Joe Smith who works on this research. And research and this ORC ID allows you to bring together all of these different research outputs which are connected by DOI. Now, R and R Studio provide us perfect tools for doing reproducible data visualization. R Studio is a wonderful tool for building visualizations, and R Studio projects are a way to reproducibly run code on different people's machines. Let me show you how that works. So, in the GitHub repository, there are two folders, pre-workshop and post-workshop. Pre-workshop is unchanged completely, so it doesn't have any of the things that I'm doing during this workshop. Post-workshop is what I've been modifying, and at the end of the workshop, I'll be putting up all my changes to GitHub. All you need to do is download these materials and double-click on this .r prod file, and it will open up RStudio, and the code will be able to run on your machine. And the reason it can run on your machine is because when we look at our function on line 36 here, we have read underscore CSV, data slash got nodes dot CSV. This is a relative file path which will work on any operating system, Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. This massively helps with the reproducibility of your data visualization. Then there's this library called Reprex which allows us to build reproducible examples of code. And this is all built around a principle of helping others to help you. Reprex ensures that all of the code necessary to run your example is included. So if you're going to Stack Overflow and you're asking a question, how do I do this in R, Reprex massively helps with that. So let me show you how that works. So if I go and I select this code and there's a problem with it, I want some help from somebody on fixing this, then I can go to the RStudio add-ins and I can select render reprex. This asks me where's my reprex source. I'm going to say it's my selected code and my target venue for my code for my output is going to be stack overflow and I'm going to render that. So this just takes a couple of seconds to generate. So my reproducible example is my clipboard and also in the viewer. So now I copy and paste this and it includes all of the messages and all of the output of the code. And we can see that there's an error here. So we can see that region import is not found. And that's because that bit of code isn't actually included in this script file. It's in the other script file. So by, by using the reprex package, I've discovered that this is not a reproducible example that others can follow to generate this visualization. I need to include the code from here. if I wanted to make this reproducible. Okay, so where does Shiny fit in all this? Well, Shiny allows us to pull data from other places on the web. So we can build a Shiny app which pulls data directly from a data repository and visualizes it. I have an example which I really quite like this. So I have worked with researchers at the Oxford Internet Institute, um, who are a bunch of social scientists that look at um, behavior online. And the Online Labor Index is a project of theirs, which, ain't, which seeks to create an economic index for the gig economy. 
And what I built for them is I built them the Shiny app, which we see here loading on screen. And this shows the current state of the online gig economy as it is understood by these researchers. So here we can see the online labor index started May 30th, 2016, and it was given a value of 100 at the beginning of the day, and then it rose to 100.3. And here we can see that the current value of the index is 138. Now we can go through different visualizations of this data, but if we click on the information tab, we get some information about the online labor index, and we can follow them on Twitter if we want. But here we have a link to the actual data set which this Shiny app pulls into itself. So we can see that um, I'm one of the authors and Vili and Otto are the two researchers that I was working with. And we can see here that the data is on version 652. That's because this data set is updated every 24 hours with the latest data from their web scraping scripts. So if we want to cite this data, and we have a unique DOI for this version or for the canonical version of that data set. So Shiny provides us a great tool for doing reproducible data visualizations because it allows us to pull data from a canonical data repository. So how can we interactively visualize social sciences data with R? Well, the Tidyverse is a collection of R packages that make data analysis, modeling, visualization, and communication as smooth as possible. These tools are really simple to use, and they allow you to get data into R, wrangle it, do exploratory data analysis, and communicate it as well. Where can you find out more about this Tidyverse, this collection of packages? Well, I thoroughly recommend the R for Data Science book. The R for Data Science book was written by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grohlmund, and it's available for free online. And what it does is it introduces the philosophy of tidy data, and it gives you a consistent approach to working with data. Now, this helps you when you're working with the tidyverse functions, but this also helps you when you're working with other packages. There are specialized packages like tidytext, which provide a workflow that fits neatly into the tidyverse. So often in the social sciences, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be mining text. So let's look at a library which is built to work with the tidyverse to do that. So I'll go back to my file explorer and I'll open up tidytext.r and I'll load the tidytext library. And what I have is I have the text of the Flatland book by Edwin Abbott saved into the data folder of this repository. So I'll import that data with read lines and I'll convert this into a data frame. And my data frame looks very simple. It's just got the line number and then the text on that line. We use the tidy text function unnest tokens to unnest the words from our text and count the number of times each word occurs. So we can see there are 2,003 times that the word the occurred and 452 times that, that occurred. So let's just load up some stop words and let's filter out those stop words using the function anti-join. So I'll run my code here. And now if I have a look at the value of flatland DF non-stops, we can see that we have the word line um, on lines 32, 38, 45, 53. And you might wonder, why do we have the word line quite so often? Well, that's because flatland is about 2D and 3D geometries. And so you have lines as characters. And you also have um, uh, polygons as characters. And the number of lines that they have corresponds to their status in society. So that's why line occurs quite often in this data set. Now what we can do is we can look at the sentiment of the text. So this code here generates me a scoring for the sentiment of each word. So we can see that clearer has a positive um, sentiment to it of two, happy, six, and we can see that hard has a negative uh, sentiment of four. 
Then I calculate the actual uh, sentiment of each line by adding the positive and the negatives together. And I put that all together into one chart here. And this just loads up. And we can see through the... Where's my chart? There we go. So we can see through the first thousand lines of our text how the sentiment of our lines changes. So we can see that Flatlands is much more negative uh, than it is positive. This really isn't a very scientific analysis of the text. It's not very rigorous at all. But this shows how the tiny text library can be used to analyze text in R and fit within the tidyverse for us to wrangle and visualize the data. Here's like. So where can you go and learn more about the tidy text? About um, R for data visualization and for using the tidyverse. Well, there are four resources which I'd very much like you uh, to have a look at. The first is the R for data science book by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Gormand, which I mentioned. There's my course on the Sage Campus Library, Interactive Visualization with R for Social Sciences. And this focuses very much on how to work with social science data, how to visualize bar charts, maps, networks, and some other charts as well. Twitter is also a great place to learn about R. I spend quite a bit of my time learning about R and what's possible and what interesting things people are doing by looking at the R stats hashtag. It's a great place to learn about R. And finally, there's the R Studio Community website. So R Studio Community is a question and answer community that R Studio have launched to provide folks with a nice friendly place to go and ask questions about R. And there is a subcategory in there for data visualization as well. Um, so that is everything that I'd like to say in this webinar. It'd be great to have any questions from you. And I hope to see you on one of my courses on the Sage campus soon. Martin, I'm, I'm hoping that my audio is, is OK. It, it's been atrocious in the past, yeah. right? Let me know. These different packages, are there competing packages out there that uh, other than say shiny or tidyverse that do the same thing and i'm going to have a follow-up from that after i get your answer okay so the tidyverse is a really good collection of packages designed to work together it's very very cohesive and it has a uh, really good philosophy for how data should work i very much recommend that everybody use the tidyverse for processing data it's fast and it's efficient so if you're working with small data sets to begin with and then start working with large data sets, the Tidyverse is massively going to help you out. Shiny, there is nothing like Shiny for building interactive content. Shiny is a complete web framework for R. We don't, we, we don't need to get into what that means uh, technically, but what it means for you as a user is you can build a web application where there is stuff being done on the server, you're calculating uh, linear regression, non-linear regressions, and things like that, and you're visualizing it for somebody in a web browser. That's what Shiny provides. The widget that I showed you, HTML, uh, sorry, uh, HiCharter, and this network, those are examples of HTML widgets. And those, there are quite a few of those. Let me show you htmlwidgets.org. So if we go to the showcase at hmlwidgets.org, we can see here that there are a number of different libraries which we can use for visualizing data. Leaflet is great for making interactive maps. I briefly showed HiCharter for making uh, charts, uh, but there's a competing library called Plotly. Um, so how does that answer your question, Michael? It, it does, um, and I have a, a very specific one in just a moment, but I just want to make sure these all play well together all the time, or do you ever come across issues where different iterations of packages are, are different? Uh, you know, your, your version 622, for example, of, of Shiny might not play well with something else. Do they always play well together? So they often play well together. The tidyverse is developed very consistently, so the tidyverse is always going to work well together well. 
uh, packages which use tidyverse principles like tidy text they may not uh, keep up to date with t the actual tidyverse as quickly as people might like so sometimes you might have to wait around before you can update to the latest version of the tidyverse and use the tidy text library R has a really good machinery for telling you whether a package works or not. Uh, so if you attempt to install a package and it's not supported by your version of R, then it will tell you. Uh, are there any packages for social network analysis in R? So there are lots of packages for social network analysis in R. So I thoroughly recommend two different libraries. So one is called iGraph. iGraph is a phenomenal package that's written in C, which folks using R, Python, and C are able to use. iGraph has a lot of uh, network analysis algorithms built into it. So it's got a lot of stuff for analyzing cliques, clusters, subgroups, and things like that. It's really very powerful. And there's another library, which is called TidyGraph. And TidyGraph provides you a way to do graph analysis, social network analysis, using the Tidyverse approach to data. I highly recommend using Tidygraph over iGraph. Tidygraph utilizes a lot of iGraph to do the actual analysis of networks, but presents you with a nice interface, which is consistent with the rest of the Tidyverse. Tidygraph is fairly new, but it is really very, very good. So could you uh, spell out the advantages in relation, uh, so this is visualization with R, but I'm wondering if you could spell out the advantages in relation to Python packages. Mm -hmm. So with Python, as soon as you start learning Python, you have to make a decision. Do I want to use Python 2? Or do I want to use Python 3? And then you have to decide, OK, well, whose Python do I want to use? Do I want to use the one that Apple provide me on my Mac? Or do I want to use Anaconda's? Or do I want to use somebody else's? And then there isn't a consistent way to install packages across all of the different operating systems. R is the only scripting language where there's a consistent way to install packages independent of what operating system you're on. So in R Studio, if I want to install a package, I use the function install.packages. Um, I type the name of the package, it goes away to CRAN, gets me the version of the package for my operating system and installs it. Furthermore, CRAN, which is where R lives, so let me get the CRAN website up, CRAN keep historical versions of packages as well. So if you need to use some of these old versions of a package, perhaps you found an old paper which is using a very old version of some packages, you can with CRAN go and get those old versions of the packages and the old versions of R, and you can reproducibly, reproducibly run that code. One last thing which I'd like to show you is I really like making maps. Maps are really fun. So let me show you how easy it is to make maps. Um, so the leaflet library is how we make maps. I have a little data set called Quakes, which has uh, earthquakes in it with latitude and longitude coordinates in it. So here we can go, lat, long, depth, mag, stations. And I can very easily visualize this. So it's just five lines of code. Of course, when, when folks say it's only five lines of code, it's only five lines of code because I know what code it is. Uh, so I'm aware of that. But let me just make you this visualization here. I want to go to ocean, another pipe, add circle markers, uh, marker cluster options.
So what I have here is I have an interactive map which clusters me together the earthquakes. So I can click on this here and um, the clusters um, spit out uh, the individual things from them. And so that's great. I've got this interactive visualization on my local machine, but I can share that with anybody in the world directly from our studio by clicking on this publish button. So this publishes to the R Pubs platform. And this, this workflow just is not possible with Python. Um, so in about two minutes, what I've gone and done is we'll call this Sage Workshop Leaflet Map. I've published a map to the web that anybody can go and look at. Um, and this just is not possible using anything other than R. I'm, I'm wondering if you could suggest any packets that we could use for content analysis or for text analysis. And you, you did bring that up earlier, but what would be some of the packages we might use? So the tidy text, um, the tidy text library is the one which I would recommend. Uh, so, so text mining with R is a book uh, written by uh, Julian David. And this introduces the tidy text library. And it is a phenomenal library, which I've seen lots of people do really interesting analysis with. I would recommend tidy text and this free to read online book as well. You know, you've mentioned a couple of times some of the, the free resources that are out there, but I'm kind of wondering a little bit, could you talk a little bit about what your class, your, uh, your Sage class would be like? Uh, especially for those that are watching that uh, might want to take make use of that uh, uh, discount code. Yes, of course. So in my code, uh, you'll see that I'm using uh, this thing here. This is called the pipe, and this is what you need to understand how to use if you're going to use the Tidyverse and you're going to be creating HTML widgets. So I go through thoroughly what the pipe is and how it works. I also go through the business of how you import data into R in a reproducible fashion. So I mentioned that we've got a reproducible way to get data into R with projects. I thoroughly introduce how to do this in my, in my uh, course on Sage Campus. And I also introduce how you can do basic analysis of your data. So when we were in code using this uh, group by function um, and summarizing, I explain what these verbs mean and how you can use them for your own data. And I also talk about how you can design visualizations which communicate your data best. I also introduce how to write very basic shiny apps. And as well as that, I also introduce you to how you can build documents which include interactive visualizations. So if you just give me 30 to 60 seconds, I can create Sage Campus R Markdown. I can create a little document which has my ggplotnet static chart. Oops. Oops. Network. Sage Campus oh, not down. Now I'll knit this together. Just takes a couple of seconds to knit together.
So our markdown is a way for us to build documents which incorporate text, images, code, and code output. And that also includes the interactive maps, interactive charts, and interactive network diagrams that you've seen me build in this short webinar. And I'll show you in the Sage Campus workshop how you can do that with your data. This is a really nice way to work because it allows you to write code in a um, literate fashion. So you can have a full explanation of what your code does alongside it. It's just taking longer than I wanted to to run this code, but I think that the reason for that is it's going through and it's trying to view the region import, isn't it? Because I was just dumping code all over the place. Uh, so let me make it simpler on myself by going like this. Oh, okay, cool. Right. You see, this is why live coding is sometimes found upon. So here we have a very, very plain uh, boring document, uh, which has got a Sage Campus on Mark down at the top, uh, ggplot, uh, static chart, and then it's got some warning messages, which I decided not to turn off. And then I have my interactive um, chart within here. Um, so this is a very, very basic um, cobbled together example of what we can do with our markdown. Um, but it's, it's really quite impressive that we can combine all of these features together. Um, you had a question about Python, so I assume that means somebody in the audience is aware of Python and IPython notebooks. The R Markdown feature of our studios is like iGraph but on step, like uh, IPython notebooks but on steroids. It's really impressive what you can do with um, R Markdown. I really love the uh, the instant payoff that we get for so much of this. It, it's kind of it, it seems to make it a lot more fun. But I'm wondering on the other side, what are some of the obstacles that you've seen to people moving on to visualization to kind of get away? You know, you talk about the dead tree and then, uh, and then interactivity and things like that. And I'm just wondering what what are some of the things that are keeping people from moving forward? So um, I think a lot of people are worried when we make data visualizations and they're not sure what to do, they're not sure how to choose the best visualization for their data. Um, a lot of people um, like making pie charts because they think that uh, they look good, but there's a lot of research to suggest that um, pie charts are often a bad way to communicate data. Uh, every pie chart could be replaced with a bar chart and bar charts should always be horizontal, and they should always be from longest bar to shortest bar. Um, people often get confused between stacked bar charts, whether they're percentile or non-percentile. So a lot of what's important when you're building visualizations is labeling them well, and putting in titles and axes, labels, and things like that. That's missed out quite a lot. Um, unfortunately, it's very, very easy to add these labels in static charts built using ggplot2, and it also is fairly easy to add these labels in the interactive charts in the, using the HTML widget libraries, which I briefly showed. Um, I will also try to recommend once more 
that folks check out my recent collaboration with the University of Sheffield called OxChef. So OxChef resources are designed to answer three questions. What chart, sh which chart should I use? Where can I host visualizations? And which publishers support interactive visualizations? I think this collection of resources is really very powerful for you to choose the best visualization for your data. Also, one thing I'd like you to understand is that all of the OxChef websites are built using R Markdown and R. So all of these interactive charts that you can see, they're all built using R and the website itself is. So even this little flow chart here, this is built using R. So we have a, a couple more questions that came out on the, on the text analysis that could kind of specific on that. And yes. one of which is, can, can we do, will this work on documents that are in PDF format? And is there any impediment to using a language other than English? So um, there are libraries that you can use for importing PDF into, into R. I haven't personally used those libraries, but I know that they exist and that it is that we can extract data from PDF. Um, there are also good optical character recognition libraries for R. So if your PDF are sadly scanned images and they're not actually uh, raw text, then you can use OCR packages in R to recognize text and import it. There are even machine uh, vision packages so you can, in R, look at how a computer analyzes an image and, and uh, looks at important details in there. In terms of other languages, Tiny Text does support other languages. Uh, we use stock words from the English language, but there are stock words from other languages as well. Um, yes, so R definitely isn't limited to just English users. Um, and that's evident from the big books in R, like the R for Data Science book and the Text Mining book. Those have been translated into Japanese and Chinese and other languages uh, from around the world as well. So R very much is a global community. If I can step away just for a second from just purely questions of pure visualization and move on to what you're talking about of giving everything a, a DOI uh, designation yeah. going forward. Is that honored by everybody or is this something, is this uh, where uh, obviously the final product often has that, but I mean to think that the, the visualizations or the data sets or things like that might have it. Is, is the community completely on board with that at this point? <laughs> so uh, sadly there's quite a few researchers who don't know what DOIs are still despite being very prolific um, authors and having lots of papers with DOI they don't really know what these weird numbers are on their papers and what, why they're there which is a little bit um, um, of a shame so DOI are used by every publisher if you're a real publisher um, then you provide DOI all data repositories provide DOI as well some of the research councils in the country where I am, which is the United Kingdom, they require that any data behind a publication that they fund is made openly accessible. And they are also starting to mandate that the code to generate any output is made accessible as well. So um, we're not that far along in that, unfortunately. Open access um, isn't taking on as, as quickly as it was hoped that it would be taken on globally, but it's definitely moving that way. ORCID, which I mentioned, but didn't actually spell out loud, um, I should mention ORCID. So I will log into my ORCID account because it's useful to show you what it looks like. So this is my unique ID for me. Um, so this is what I, I'm sorry, thank you, for, thank you Michael for sharing the screen. Um, so this is my ORC ID, um, so this is what I put in when I, when I submit new papers to publishers. 
And what ORCID does is it looks over Crossref and data science and data site. And it automatically creates you a portfolio of all your research outputs which have DOI. So we can see here that it says I have 17 works. And these are 17 publications and data sets which are published somewhere that issue a DOI that have my ORCID attached. So if you use ORCID and DOI, then it massively helps you. And R have recently added support for ORC IDs to be added into the description field on R packages, which is a really exciting development. Good. I'm glad we could end on a, on a happy note uh, <laughs> moving forward. So that's uh, right now, that, and the audience, that's all we have time for today. And I want to thank you for joining us and give a special thank you to our guest, Martin Hadley. And in the coming weeks, and I, I see a couple of questions that are coming on this, you can expect an email that includes a link to view the archive webinar and slides. Um, and this will be hosted on methodspace.com and on the Sage Campus blog at campus.sagepub.com. And please, please, please don't forget that discount code, B-I-Z-W-E-B-50 for Sage Campus courses. And um, uh, keep in mind that tomorrow we're going to have another Sage Campus uh, webinar, this one on Python. So at uh, March 8th at 4 p.m. GMT, which is 11 a.m. EST and 8 a.m. Pacific time, Rob Master Domenico will present a live Python session showing how Python can be utilized for social data. And for our audience and for all our Canadian Football League fans out there, uh, thank you very much. Goodbye.